on the 7th of June 2005, a young lady by the name of Augustina Arebu would board a bus from Benin City heading to Abuja to meet her fiancé, Ifine Ozo. This journey would lead to one of the most heartbreaking tragedy in Nigerian history. Ifine Ozo was a young businessman from Enugu State who dealt with motor spare parts. He did not complete his education, so at a very young age, he moved to Zamfara State where he learned mechanics. After many years of being an apprentice, he moved to Abuja where he opened a shop at the Apple Market in Abuja there, dealing with motor spare parts. Ifine was so successful that he even had two shops, two motor spare parts shops at two different markets in Abuja. But his major market was the one at Apple Market and the other one was sometimes run by his younger brother Elvis Ozo who lived with him in his self-contained in Abuja there. Now, according to Elvis, that morning on the 7th of June, it was said that Ifine woke up with a particular glow as though he was expecting something good to happen that day. Now, the press referred to Augustine as Ifine's fiancé but it was sort of implied by Elvis that the relationship between Augustina and Ifine was sort of brand new. But regardless of whether or not this relationship was brand new or old, it doesn't justify the horrible events that unfolded later that night on the 7th of June 2005. In that Apple market, Ifine had four friends, all within the age of 20 to 25. They were all Igbos. They were all mechanics who dealt with motor spare parts. And they all owned their respective shops. Their names were Chinedu, Anthony, Polinus, and Ekene. Ifine had told them all about Augustina, so, you know, they were also excited to meet her for the first time. Ifine didn't have a vehicle, but as a mechanic, finding a vehicle wouldn't be that hard. I mean, he swims in vehicles. A day before, or earlier that day on the 7th, it was said that a politician had come to bring his vehicle to Ifine's shop to fix it. It was said the senator even paid 150,000 naira upfront for Ifine to fix it. This is to show you the caliber of mechanic Ifine was. He was the one who dealt with politician vehicles. So Ifine was a big boy by all rights. It's unclear if Ifine finished fixing the vehicle first or before he fixed it. But what was said that Ifine, upon seeing the vehicle, you know, told his younger brother Elvis to check the vehicle in case there was any form of weapons or drugs or anything implicating and Elvis did just that. After Elvis checked the vehicle and saw that it was clean, he told Ifine that yeah, the vehicle is clean and Ifine was like, cool, we'll take it to a spin. Now, like I've said, it's unclear if Ifine had fixed it before he drove it or if he was driving it first to fix it later on but that was the vehicle Ifine used that day to pick up his friends and then pick up Augustina and then drove all the way to a ninth club. They drove to the Grand Mirage Hotel in Abuja where the ninth club was located. At the time, Grand Mirage was one of the top spots for big boys. It was a big boys club. So if anyone could actually afford the Grand Mirage at the time, you were officially a big boy. And it was said that this wasn't the first time for Ifine and his friends to actually come to the Grand Mirage Hotel. So they've been at this club before multiple times in the past. So they were not new to the club. However, it was Augustina's first time to this club. Possibly her first time in Abuja and unfortunately, her last time. Now, when they were in the club, they had a few drinks, they partied, they danced, they chatted. It was like every other kind of club in the 2000s. So, it wasn't like anything special. There were tables, music, food, drinks. People had their cliques. Everyone had their table. People had their corners. People were mingling. People were there with their dates. People were there with their friends. People were there with their family. And so, it was just a normal night club with the loud music, I'm guessing. So while Augustina was having a good time with her boyfriend Ifine and his friends, somebody at the corner was giving her the look. And it turned out that this person was the then Deputy Commissioner of Police by the name of Mr. Ibrahim Danjuma. Ibrahim Danjuma was present in that ninth club that day and he was the one giving Augustina the eye. He was the one winking, cutting eye and you know, giving a distant gesture from afar, more like he was hitting on her from afar. And it was said that Augustina caught all those gleams and all those glances, but she just 
wasn't bothered by it. After all, she knew she was pretty, so it's not surprising that someone was hitting on her. It's possible at some point she must have told the boys that say, hey, this guy is giving me the eye and they were like probably laughing it off as, you know, trying to tell her that, wow, you're beautiful, of course, somebody is going to give you the eye. All in all, Augustina plainly just ignored the gestures and focused on her boyfriend and his friends. But this did not sit well with Mr. Ibrahim Danjima, who wasn't used to people not responding positively to his eye winking, I guess. It was said that Mr. Danjima got up on his feet and walked to where Augustina was, totally ignoring the five boys she was sitting with and began to make advances at her. This was the moment that would lead to one of the longest court battles in Nigerian history. A tragedy that would have been avoided if this man just sat his butt down where he was and focused on the other girls that were throwing themselves all over him. But no, he decided to get up and go meet Augustina. So it's not clear if he was wearing his uniform but I want to believe he was. That should give him more bragging rights or that should probably give him the courage to stand up from his own seat to walk up to Augustina, ignore all the five guys she was with to ask her out. I mean, you have to wear the uniform of strength and power to be able to do that. I don't think he would have done that in his day wear or mufti wear. He was most likely in his uniform when he did that. And so if he was with his uniform, I'm sure there were many girls there who would want to throw themselves on him. He was young, handsome, powerful and basically rich. So Mr. Danjima could literally get any girl he wanted at that club. However, it was a girl who was ignoring his wings and eyes that he decided to go for. Why do we always go for the things we can't have? Oh. Man. I personally can't even approach a girl who is in the company of her younger brother. Talk more of a girl who is in the company of five young men. You must be Jesus to be able to do that kind of a thing. Because even the deputy commissioner of police failed. When Danjima approached Augustina directly, it was said she graciously turned him down. Uh, I'm sorry sir, thank you for your compliment. I know I'm pretty, thank you so much for the drinks if you've bought them for me. But I am with my boyfriend and we are having a good time and you know, thank you. And of course, it was said that the guys were quiet at first, hoping that the girl's kind rejection was going to do the magic and this man would respect himself and go back to his seat. But, you know, that didn't work. Apparently, Mr. Danjima might have not been so used to being rejected. And so he persisted, he continued, he tried all the tricks on his sleeves just to get this girl to, you know, probably go to his booth with him or go to his table with him or maybe take her home I guess only God knows what he was planning to do with her but the girl rejected again for the second time and at this point Ifain and his friends could not just sit and keep quiet they had to step in and when they stepped in of course things was going to go south this way guys and a man and so this was about power now at this point who with this girl listening to deputy commissioner of police or four mechanics from Apple market like who is she going to follow home tonight? And it was clear that Augustina had already made her choice despite the fact that she now knew that this was a high-ranking officer in the police. She still chose to be with the guy she had come all the way from Benin to see and this did not sit well with Mr. Danjuma. At the same time, Mr. Danjuma's persistence on hitting on this girl did not sit well with Ifine and his friends and it was said that there was an argument, there was a scuffle at some point, maybe fist must have been exchanged or maybe words must have been exchanged. But what was said for a fact is there was chaos at the club. And it might have been this point that the word fiancé was used or tossed around, you know, just to show the extent in which the relationship between Ifine and Augustina was in order to scare off or show off Mr. Danjima. You know, one of those moments when you're like, Oh, she's my fiancé. When someone tries to exaggerate their relationship with someone in order to, you know, make emphasis as to why certain things should not happen. Maybe if I introduce himself as the fiancé to the girl so that Mr. Danjima can, you know, back off. Apparently, I don't think that was going to stop him. And, you know, if that didn't work, I guess that would have led to a fight in the club. Now, some sources said that the club owners and the bouncers had to intervene and it was when they found out that Mr. Danjima was at fault because
because this is not the first time he's doing such a thing. He was asked to leave. But I'm having a hard time believing this source because I don't know, is this the Nigeria I know? Was Nigeria good in 2005? Because I don't imagine the hotel owners would want to kick out the deputy commissioner of police from their ninth club. I don't think they would want to do that. I, I, I doubt. I don't know. If they did it then, wow, then that was impressive back then. But if they didn't do it, I wouldn't be surprised. However, there's a second source that claimed that when Mr. Danjima couldn't fight this boy's back, when Mr. Danjima saw that he had lost, he stormed out of the club shamefully and angrily and just walked out completely. Yeah, this is more believable. This is more believable. So after Mr. Danjima stormed out the club, the boys celebrated, they were happy, finally they fought out a bully and they tried to calm the situation down, the club had to go back to being, you know, hyped and the groove, the music kept on playing. It was said that the boys and Augustina, they stayed a little while longer just to make sure they had a good time, just to make sure that they had fun and that was what they did. Not knowing something very horrible was waiting for them outside the club in the streets of Abuja. The funny thing about this story is anytime I think of it and when I was researching about it, I tried to see all the possible ways this could have been avoided. And honestly, the thing is, once a mind is made up to do evil, once the mind of a human being is made up to do evil, it's almost like only God can take control of that situation. Unfortunately, in this particular situation, it seems the devil might have won. It was said that when Mr. Danjuma stormed out of the club, he met with a group of policemen at a checkpoint near the hotel at Gimbia Street, Garki in Abuja. He told these policemen that they should be watchful of five group of boys with a lady that he had gotten a call of an armed robber activity in the neighborhood. And so the policemen at the checkpoint were on the lookout. I mean, it was their job. So they were told by their deputy commissioner of police that armed robbers are on their way coming towards their direction and that they should look out. And of course they will look out. They will do their job, right? And so once Ifine and his friends finished clubbing, they decided that it was time to go home. As they drove through the streets of Gimbia, it was said that a vehicle moved right in front of them, blocking them instantly, causing them to stop. Now, this vehicle that blocked them was that of Mr. Ibrahim Danjuma. It was said that once Mr. Ibrahim Danjuma came out from his vehicle, he ordered the policemen at the checkpoint to shoot, which they did. Now, this part of this story as we know it was what was said during the court hearings and during the panel of inquiry hearings. So that was one side of how this happened. The other side to how this happened was that when Mr. Danjuma stopped the vehicle of Ifine with his own vehicle, you know, by blocking them, it was said that he came out of his vehicle, collected guns from the policemen and he did the shooting himself. Now this only came from the testimony of the policemen who were on trials because towards the end you get to see that when these people went to court, which they did, they began pointing fingers. Nahim Dwam, Nahim Dwam, you did it, you did it. It was through these confessions in court that we got to have these two versions of how this happened on the streets. But the major story or the major account was that when Mr. Danjuma came down from his car, he told the policemen at the checkpoint that these are the armed robbers. I told you about shoot them and instantly the policemen shot it was said they shot rapidly killing about four of them instantly including Ifine. the only two people that were left was Anthony and Augustina now let me just put in my own input here this is why I believe the policemen in the court that accused Mr. Danjuma of being the one to shoot. You see, if it was a policeman at the checkpoint who did all the shooting, like Mr. Danjuma ordered them to, and if they shot rapidly, like, you know, sprayed the bullet all over the car, they would have killed everyone, or at least injured some. But for the fact that Augustina was not shot at that checkpoint, for the fact that Augustina was not killed at that checkpoint, it 
kind of made sense to think that it's someone who knew her that would not shoot her which is why i believe mr danjima might have been the one who had done the shooting himself because he knew the girl and left her and probably the reason why he left the boy anthony was maybe anthony was the one at the club who did not challenge him the most as to the other boys who did which was why he killed them instantly leaving anthony and um, augustina so the fact that augustina was not killed at that checkpoint during the gun spray and gun firing I kind of want to believe the policeman in the courtroom who told the judges and the panel that it was Mr. Danjima who shot the gun and not them. It makes sense because the policemen at the checkpoint do not know these people. They weren't at the club. Even if they were going to shoot under the orders of a high ranking officer, they would have killed everyone. They would have killed anyone and not spared the girl. After all, they've been told that they are all armed robbers. So the fact that Augustina was still alive, yeah. Good try. I, I believe Mr. Danjima was the one who did the shooting. But let's go on with what the popular story says. The popular story said that when the policemen shot, they didn't kill Augustina and another guy there, Anthony. And they took Augustina and Anthony to the Garki police station. Why did they leave Augustina and why did they leave Anthony? I do not know. They really wanted to paint the impression of uh, we saw armed robbers and we caught two alive and they tried to escape and you know they wanted to create a story. Now it was said that when Augustina and Anthony were taken to the station, they were handed to the person in charge of that station, Mr. Otsman Abdul Salam. He was the officer in charge of that station and when he saw Augustina and um, Anthony, I am thinking he was also told the same thing that they were armed robbers and they had killed their fellow gangs and clearly Augustina and Anthony were you know trying to vindicate themselves but we all know how this goes regardless of what you say to the police they will still see you as what they want to see you so it was said that abdul salam called the family of augustina and anthony for ransom 5,000 naira ransom at the time, it was a big deal then. So, 5,000 naira ransom, which the family, you know, were struggling to raise. Now, this was in the midnight. So, Augustina's family in Benin were getting this call, and uh, Anthony's family from, you know, the market there were also getting this call as to get ransom to be released from prison. And I think this calling for ransom was where the police fucked up. And I think this is where maybe Mr. Danjuma, if he did all of these things, also fucked up because he would have just killed them all and called them armed robbers but for the fact he kept anthony and augustina alive that kind of was where everything blew up for them because when anthony and augustina were unable to provide this ransom they were killed now it's unclear the altercation before they were killed but it was said that augustina was strangled to death while anthony was shot execution style apparently that was it and when they killed Agostina and Anthony, they took their bodies to join the other group. And out of nowhere, guns, weapons, knives, ammunition, bullets was placed on the scene next to the bodies of these six young people. And the photographer was called again for the second time to take the pictures. According to the photographer's testimony, he said he had to be called twice to take pictures of you know the same group of people and i think he said when he came the first time he didn't see the weapons it was the second time that he came to take the picture that the weapons just appeared and you know two more dead bodies also showed up which was what he and he had to do his job so he took the pictures and went on with his job it was the pictures of the bodies of these young people that were eventually publicized to the public the very next day when news got around that armed robbers were caught at Garki and the police did their job it was said that the armed robbers fired at the police and the police fired back and the police succeeded in killing all of them and they were heroes they showed on the television there the, the, the weapons that were found in the vehicles of these armed robbers and at the time the police were seen as heroes people were like wow our policemen have done their job once again proud policemen give them a round of applause Woo! what the police failed to know was that when anthony was given a chance to call his family to ask them to pay up the ransom anthony told the story as it happened anthony told his family that they had met someone at the club, the deputy uh, commissioner of police who approached the girl and the girl refused and that it was this deputy commissioner of police who blocked them on the road and killed some of their friends and asking them for ransom. So Anthony had already told the story before they killed him and now the story has been told from Anthony's side. Luckily for him, since dead men cannot tell stories, Anthony before he died 
told the story. The next day, words got out in Apple Market. Elvis heard the news of his brother passing. They went to the police station. They confirmed that their brothers have been killed. But then the story had already been told, and soon instantly riots began. People marched to the police station. They protested. It was like what is happening, and the world got to learn what really happened that day and that the police were lying that these people were armed robbers whereas they were not armed robbers and i think at this time nigerians were already very very you know quick and instantly even though there wasn't social media there we had our way of opera we had our way of making our voice heard and Sanjo, who was the president at the time heard the cries of Nigerians calling for proper investigation to the killing of these six young people. Were they armed robbers or were they framed by a bloodthirsty police officer who thought they could get away with this? And instantly, Obasan just set up a panel of inquiry to go through what just happened to the apostles, to see if they were armed robbers, to see if they had those guns in their possession, to see if they ever shot at the police. That was how the panel of the inquiry was able to discover and unfold all the story that I've just told you. They were able to learn that earlier that day, this group of men had met with Mr. Danjuma in the club where a scuffle was said to have happened between them. And there was a police officer who was supposed to testify before the panel to give evidence to back these claims up, to back the fact that these Apple Six were innocent up. Ironically, that police officer was poisoned the day before he was supposed to show up at the panel. It was said that he was poisoned by fellow police officers because he had hung out with those police officers the night before and unfortunately the next day when he was supposed to testify in front of the uh, panel of inquiry he died but that did not stop the panel of inquiry to do their job and they were able to identify the fact that the weapons that was placed on these people's body the weapons that was claimed to have been gotten from the vehicle of these Apple 6 was a weapon that had been recovered two weeks before the incident in an entirely different case and it was said that it was taken away from the Garki police station and placed on them. Another funny business that the police did was that when they shot these six people, they immediately got death certificates, they immediately just got everything that they could get. They got a plot of land for burial sites and quickly buried all six of them. Who does that? They buried all six of them in a shallow grave somewhere near the police station just away from it at a very basic uh, cemetery. Even before the family could claim the bodies, they just took the bodies and buried it. The panel of inquiry immediately asked for an exhumation. All their bodies were exhumed and their bodies were taken for autopsy. Although it was said that the person in charge of the autopsy could not determine the actual cause of death for four of the victims but two of them were checked which was Augustina's own and it was discovered that Augustina was killed by strangulation while Anthony was shot at a close range and mere looking at the other bodies although they were said to have been badly decomposed the autopsy result was able to say that they were also shot to their death instantly the panel of inquiry was able to name all eight police officers involved and through that panel they were able to take all eight of them to court. Now the Apple Six case in court was a long battle. It spanned over 12 years. It was a messy journey back and forth with the police officers pointing finger at the other. This one saying, I did not do it. You did it. He did it. He was the one who did it. It was not me. You know, that was what it was. And so the judge was trying to establish a fact. They were trying to establish beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah, I think that is how they do it. While every single police officers were, you know, trying to hold their head and save their name you know at that point in time all of them had to answer their surname all of them were on their own they were all trying to come up with the best defense as to get out of this even mr danjima himself because he was also mentioned among the eight police officers to face trial by the panel of inquiry because when they asked him when they asked mr danjima he claimed that he was called by people about armed robbers and when he came to the scene he told the checkpoint people and he thought that they were the armed robbers 
and funny enough there had been an armed robbery attack that day but it was discovered by the panel that the armed robbery attack that Mr. Danjima was talking about were not even people who had a car, they used leg. So how could Mr. Danjima have mistaken it? It did not seem right to the panel of inquiry which was why they had to throw his name in there to face the court and which he did. After 12 years in court in 2017, the judge found only two officers guilty and sentenced them to death. While the rest, he could not sentence them because there wasn't really enough evidence to prove that they had killed these people. The thing here is, these two people who were sentenced to death were sentenced to death for the killing of Augustina and Anthony. Now, the other four people who were killed at the checkpoint, nobody was tried for that. Nobody has paid for that. Nobody has been sentenced for that because the two police officers who were sentenced to death were constables. They were the ones at the police station at the time. So all the ones at the checkpoint who did the shooting, nobody was arrested for that because the judges and the people in charge of the courts and the people in charge of the prosecution could not identify or determine who and who shot because this one is saying he's him this one is saying it's not me this one is pointing at this one this one is pointing at that one and that was how they could not charge anyone for the killing of the four boys at the checkpoint but after these two police officers were said to have been sentenced to death it was said that they came forward and told everybody that it was mr danjima who asked us to do the shooting that he was the one who gave the orders and you know that was all they could say there still wasn't enough evidence that he gave the orders so the judge couldn't sentence mr danjima but he was kept in custody but soon he was released due to a medical condition and as if that was not bad enough it was said that mr danjima applied to get his job back which he got his job he was not only given back his job he was paid every salary from 2005 till 2017 that he had missed and as if that too was not enough he was promoted to assistant inspector general of police this was a total slap in the face of the families of the victims of the apple six are you people kidding me the man who has been accused of orchestrating this tragedy has been promoted to assistant inspector general of police make it make sense so ironically this is the end of the apple 6 story right now the apple 6 story is a case that is still ongoing it's a case that is still currently among the nsas protest campaign and the last we heard of it was when the lawyer of the families of the apple 6 demanded more money be paid to their family you know at the time they were paid 3 million now the lawyer is asking that the families be paid 200 million because the people that were killed were the breadwinners so that is where we are mr danjima is living his life he's in his job he's getting paid his pension he is literally living his life and the families of the victims of the apple six are still grieving every single year hoping and praying that one day this case will be revisited and true justice will be brought to the victims of the apple six killing so thank you guys for watching i hope you enjoyed the story and if you were able to watch this to the end please leave a comment to let me know your thoughts do you think mr danjima would ever face the law again for this particular crime or do you think it's over let me know your thoughts don't forget to like this video subscribe to my channel and turn on your notification button so whenever there is a new video you will be the first to know thank you for watching